Good afternoon, and welcome to Building Boston and Beyond. I'm your host, Lydia Rivera. Uh, Building Boston and Beyond is a show that uh, showcases the many projects underway in the city of Boston and beyond. Uh, as we know, engaging communities, engaging feedback, sharing information with residents in the communities is critical. As we know right now, Boston, construction in Boston is booming. Transportation projects are underway. We have the Green Line extension going into Somerville, Cambridge, Medford. We have the Longfellow Bridge uh, being reconstructed. Uh, the seaport is booming. So with that said, while we have these transportation projects, we like to talk about how communities intersect with transportation modes like walking, cycling, uh, other traffic, where they share the same thoroughfare, but where are the benefits of the communities and how people get from A to B, and what option would be most beneficial for that person uh, pertaining to their, obviously, destination that day. With us today is Mark Chase of Tufts University. He's a lecturer of um, urban environmental policy and planning, and he's going to share with us his expertise and also his hands-on approach to uh, the skills and uh, tools necessary uh, to effectively plan transportation projects. Thanks so much for coming, Mark. I really appreciate it, and um, I know you're really busy, but it worked out. <laughs> Great to be here. So I'm just curious, um, let's just talk about, you've been around for a long time. I know you from my transportation world and my career at the T, and you are a transportation advocate, but also, too, uh, you, you are our lecturer at Tufts, and you have a really, I was looking at the class that you, uh, you uh, provide at Tufts, and it sounds very interesting. And I, I'd just like to know a little background on what drives you to be in this career. Well, um, I've, I've always been interested in how transportation affects people's lives and how <clears throat> we spend so much time getting around. And even when we're not getting around, we're kind of in the places where other people are getting around, just standing in front of your house. There might be traffic or people walking. And so paying attention to those spaces and paying attention to how we get around so that it's easier and more pleasurable, really, because you know, nobody wants to be uncomfortable as they're getting around. They want to be happy. So, mm -hmm. you know, how do you intersect right. the function with the form? How do you get the streets to really be great places? Mm -hmm. And I noticed that you do focus on and think about how transportation affects the disabled, the elderly, right, uh, right. you know, the economy, just everything yeah. in the community. Well, it's, it's kind of interesting. If you look at the most vulnerable <laughs> parts of the population, like the elderly, the very young, um, disabled, if you plan for them, it works for everybody, really. It's kind of they're like our baseline. And I think in the past, we haven't done a great job of that. And as a result, we've kind of all suffered because it hasn't been really easy or comfortable for kids to get around. So you have to drive them everywhere. Your elderly, same, same kind of problem. Mm -hmm. Maybe they do drive, but maybe they shouldn't be driving. Mm -hmm. So you know, designing a system that <clears throat> can really get people on the edges who maybe aren't fully abled um, then solves a lot of our problems. Right, right, and I believe it's about options. And it's about something. options, and it's about designing literally from the ground up. And and you know, if you put a great transit system in a place that isn't built well, the transit system won't have much ridership, and people won't really have any place to go. If you think of some of the cities where everybody drives, Boston, fortunately, has been around since what really was a pioneer in transit, mm -hmm. like over a hundred years ago. So our streets are set up for transit, and that's a real asset, and that's why the MBTA is one of the best transit systems for ridership in the country. See, I like that you're an advocate of the MBTA. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. Yeah, a good transit system is part of our hierarchy, I would call it. First, you want mm -hmm. a good walking system, a good biking system, and then a good transit system. And if you have those three things, you're going to have an amazing city. And the driving, of course, is important. But you need to kind of put it in a hierarchy of mm -hmm. if you have a good walking system, people can walk to transit. If you have a good biking system, that expands that and transit works better. Right. And then there's less competition for the road. If everybody drives, then you have this terrible traffic like they have in LA. Mm -hmm. So it actually, car drivers benefit from everybody who takes a T and walks and bikes. So right. Now, I know you've been like in partnerships in the past. City of Somerville, the city of Boston, right. to say the MBTA, right. in like even like... Uh, cycling and zip car right, and right. alternatives to right. transportation. So how do you engage? It's interesting, these partnerships that you fostered, mm -hmm. it, it can be difficult to, to get people on board. 
Yeah, sometimes people don't believe that right. change will work and that <laughs> if you do things that will make a difference. You know, when Zipcar started, a lot of people said, hey, everybody in the United States drives, nobody's going to want to share a car. But in fact, because everybody did drive, that was exactly why Zipcar worked. You know, there was a lot of people who were used to driving and now Zipcar is the biggest car sharing company in the world. And that's, you know, in part because Americans actually do love to drive, but now we have many people sharing a car instead mm -hmm. of owning their own car, which mm -hmm. is really great for cities. Right, and then it obviously it creates alternatives to driving. So people may take yeah. a zip car shopping and then realize, oh, I don't need to take yeah. the car to go here. The key thing with zip car is that, that the price of driving the car is folded right into your hourly rate. When you own a car, kind of your insurance and the cost of the car were long ago paid and you forget about them. With mm -hmm. Zipcar, like, the price is right there and you want to use that car very mm -hmm. efficiently. I went to Home Depot this morning because I had to get some stuff early this morning. Mm -hmm. And I was just brutally efficient because I, I was paying for that car. I wanted to get it back in mm -hmm. time. So. <laughs> now, when you look at all the, I mean, you're a lecturer and you have this, I was reading right. the, the course description and you talk about transportation uh, relating to affordable housing. And right, do, yes. Let's talk about that. Like, yeah, that's an interesting connection that I think a lot of people don't make, but cars are very expensive and to own. And then when you do own them, the parking spaces are very expensive to build. And that's actually, my, I have a consulting service where I work on parking issues. Um, parking can, in Boston can be $100,000 a space. Um, to build, and that's when it's underground. When it's above ground, it might be 50,000. So that's adding to the cost of your housing. And our problem really is that the neighbors are afraid of overflow, mm -hmm. so they're forcing developers to build parking. And then when they force developers to build parking, it's making every single house more expensive. Okay. And then it's encouraging the buyers or the renters of that house to own a car, because would you wanna move into a house with a parking space and pay for that parking space mm -hmm. if you didn't own a car? It wouldn't make sense. You really. Right. You're kind of then almost fueling. So it's kind of a, a difficult thing that Boston, I know, is working on, and Somerville and Cambridge are all working on, is how can we set up our zoning and our parking so that it kind of encourages people to not own a car if they don't want to. If they do own a car, they have a space, but kind of getting the signals right. Well, even the parking, the layering of cars in a parking facility. Right, yeah. That's. I mean, it's creative, but it's... Right. The more you layer, the more expensive it is. So that's again, adds to the cost. But mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of great technology solutions that kind of make more cars... Compact. Compact cars, but those are still very expensive. Mm -hmm. So the best thing we can do is kind of make a lot of alternatives so that mm -hmm. people don't need to drive. Mm -hmm. And then um, look at our parking very carefully and think about, you know, on Beacon Hill, is it right to have like free parking on Beacon Hill, which is currently is. If you're a resident, you can get a resident permit sticker on Beacon Hill for nothing. And As to, opposed to other <laughs> communities, no. Um, other communities have modest fees, mm -hmm. but if, if, we, if we have free parking on street, it's gonna make people always wanna use that space That's in an inappropriate way. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would posit that if we charge people for parking but take that money that we raise, don't put it, don't put it in the city but give it to community mm -hmm. groups so that they can make their communities better, mm -hmm. I think we'll be more open to paying for parking. Right. But the paying for parking is then going to fold back into all kinds of benefits to the community. That, no, you make a good point. Um, now, what do you think about the T and the, uh, the, the impact of the late night service? I mean, do you think that's, a, it's, it's, it seems like it's working it's from great. what I've seen. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think with the T, the issue I think is always, will the state fund the T well enough so that we can provide excellent service? Mm -hmm. Because people here will use the service. We have mm -hmm. the density, we have people who don't own cars, who use Zipcar, we have a lot of students. The T is gonna get used, but do we want a world-class transit system right, or not? And right. do we want it to run on time? And do we want the cars to be new and not 40 years old? And those are the questions mm -hmm. that I think the answer is yes, right. but then really we have to, you know, get the politics behind that. Right, I'd like to hear your insight because I mean, I believe that you, you know, you are somewhat of an expert in, in the transportation and alternatives. And what about the fares? I mean, are you, ha are you content with where they are today? Do you feel like it should be <laughs> I well, mean, in a professional way, if you're... I'm, I'm not the right person to ask oh, because okay. I can afford the fares. And right. I think 
for people who can't afford the fares, I think they would say they're too high. And, right. and one of the things that transit serves really well are people who don't own cars. And as you get into low income mm -hmm. populations, 75% of people don't own cars. So most of they're those dependent. people, they're depending on the T. And you know, with technology, we could make their fares more affordable. And for someone like me, I could pay more. You know, I think there are ways that we can right, that we could make it fairer based on people's income mm -hmm. using technology. I think we don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to just say everybody pays the same price. If you have low income, maybe you should have mm -hmm. a free fare. You know? Well, you know what they're doing right now is the uh, Fairmont corridor. They're trying to the MBTA is trying to enhance service along the I mean yeah. ridership along the Fairmont corridor. Yeah. So a lot of people don't realize that Zone One A is like a is a subway. Right. Uh, cost. Right, I didn't. And that, so. Yeah, and you you can get <laughs> yeah. on the commuter rail at Uppins Corner and it, that's and great. I think for the price of a subway. That's great. But I think that the public is just so uh, channeled thinking that it's going to cost them more because it's the purple line right. and it's nicer. I they're they're that, going to yeah. take like a couple of buses to the local train station. So That'd it's about shame. education. It really is. Yeah, I think, you know, especially with transit. Um, Low-income people will figure that out, but why make them work to figure that out? Let's make it easy for them so that they know when these stations are available, they can get into town quickly and easily. Um, right, right. Yeah. Now, who are you working with in, as far as partnerships right now? What's the, is there? A um, right now, I'm working with a collaboration in both Boston and Somerville, mostly in Somerville, but also in Boston, around taking our quiet neighborhood streets and forming a network where kids and families can get around on foot or bicycle between schools and squares and parks in the city in a comfortable way. So it's kind of repurposing in a way our streets. It's not really um, changing them fundamentally except the way they look and feel. So you change the way the street looks so that it engages kids and families and kind of makes a, a network. Do you have an example of that? Is like We will next spring in Somerville and and Boston's going slowly but they're 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 working on something on the Fairmont corridor. It's called the Fairmont Greenway. Okay. And the Fairmont Greenway is several miles long. It goes and I'm I'm kind of loosely I'm working with a woman yep. on this more on strategy than the alignment. Mm -hmm. So the alignment goes from kind of that part of Mass Ave and Dorchester which is just all industrial. Yep all the way through to Mattapan, kind of along the Fairmont okay. corridor. Yep. All mostly quiet streets and it's gonna form a way that you can get, you know, all the way across town if you wanted to, but on these streets that are really quite family friendly, quieter streets. Mm -hmm. No, that sounds that sounds exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting because we have these streets, we're just not really using them. So it's right. kind of a way of rethinking the way the street's gonna be used. And right. the residents right. will still have access with their cars, but the when you're on the street and you see a child say playing in the street, mm -hmm. you won't be like, Why is this child playing in the street? It'll be like, Oh yes, this is a greenway. You know, mm -hmm. we've we've converted this street into a, a a family friendly street and there'll be things on the street that tell you that it's family friendly. Right. Now in your course, are these uh, students transportation planners, majors, like wh where well, are they headed? That's a good question. Some of them are. Um, about, I'd say 80% of them are in things like housing policy, community development, and transportation is one element of that. Mm -hmm. You know, that it all fits together like a big puzzle. Um, I'd say like 20% do go into the field and end up becoming working for the city of Boston. Mm -hmm. um, there's someone who's in Mayor Walsh's, um, I don't know what to call it, his, his, his senior staff and yeah. Chris Carter. He was okay. also working for Menino, um, who was one of my students, is doing great things in the city of Boston. Really? So, yeah. So um, with regard to the city of Boston and uh, Mayor Walsh just coming on, I mean, do you have any ideas and, and, and direction well, they should take with regard I do. to alternatives? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he has a great asset to work with with the city of Boston because it already is such a great city to live in, such a great walking city, such a great transit city. I, I, if I were him, I would focus on, you know, people's lives and trying to make, you know, transit, walking, biking really great because if you do that, it's going to make the whole system work better and even drivers are going to start to feel the effect of not having so much competition on the road that there will be more people um, enjoying the city and I think although we're a great walking city we still have a ways to go with biking and then with mm -hmm. transit I think you know the city can probably take more of a lead than it has I think the MBTA is a state organization in a way it's like a regional organization mm -hmm. but the city I think could be more proactive and kind of Right. pushing some good 
some mm -hmm. good policies that, that can get the T going and maybe thinking of some creative funding mm -hmm. that can do some things for, for the T downtown and, and the neighborhoods. No, I like, I mean, I appreciate how the state and the city, you know, came together for even implementing the late night service. Yes. As quickly as great. they did and yeah. gaining the support of um, the private um, entities yeah. to help with the funding. I'll be interested to see if accident, ra accident rates go down. Obviously, people love it, but the fact that you, you know, may not need to drive and you may not need, like, a designated driver and, you know, it's, it's obviously what people are doing at very late at night, mm -hmm. you know, you may not want them behind the wheel of a car. And I'm, I'm not sure. I just remember from my younger days. That, no, no, exactly. Um, <laughs> but you know what's so interesting, what you said earlier, is it's definitely a quality of life issues yes. and quality of People have to understand that. It's even just yeah. the stress yeah. of driving. Exactly, yeah. I Could lengthen your life. <laughs> it could. I moved here 20 years ago, and I really disliked Boston until I sold my car. And it was never a conscious decision like, driving isn't fun, I'm going to sell my car. My car broke down. Zip car was started about the same time. And I was like, suddenly I was liking the city more. And I realized afterwards that it was I was not driving as much and that driving was impacting my view of the city. Now, mm -hmm. everybody's not like me, but personally, like my life, my stress level went way down and my opinion of the city went way up after I started getting around on foot. And well, personally, did. I do see a lot more walkers and cyclists. I Mm. For example, when I drive by, look at when I drive by Broadway Station and the uh, the bridge that leads over to um, Berkeley Street, yeah. you see more foot traffic. Yeah, and people would never go over You're that right. bridge. That's a good you know, point. I always see people walking yeah. in their professionals. Yeah. And, you know, just anyone. Yeah, and it's been a while. I used to do a lot of work down there, but I'm not sure how comfortable that bridge is. Is it any more comfortable than it used to be? Is it a nicer bridge? Yeah, it's than, a nicer okay, bridge. Okay, and then okay, you good. do have the option of the Broadway Bridge and then the bridge I was talking about. Okay, and the, you always see foot traffic. People, okay. I noticed that good. while South Boston is quite congested, that people are opting to walk because, sure. you know, the buses are at capacity. Yeah. You know, because of the... Uh, the large, you know, obviously, influx of um, yeah. people who live in South Boston right now, and you have apartments with, you know, three roommates, and right. they may all have cars. So this is this is a good problem to have, but I think, you know, if the buses are at capacity, this is another thing for Mayor Walsh. How can we work with the T to, mm -hmm. to relieve some of that peak period capacity, get some more buses on? Mm -hmm. It's a challenge financially, but it's it's a quality of life issue, and if the city's going to be a world-class city, mm -hmm. you know, that's these are the kinds of things that you know, if you see too many people on the bus at a certain time. Um, right, right. And I think it's the educational process. I know on the T website, they'll give you the options. Are you, you know, walking, driving? And they'll show you even how yeah. to walk places. So I think that's where it starts if other organizations take on creating and investing in um, informational yeah. sites like that. Yeah, there's Livable Streets, which is a really great organization that's promoting multimodal transportation. I was on their board early on and still support them greatly. They are doing some great work in this kind of multimodal fit. Mm -hmm. um, so Singapore, uh, you're, you're thinking about your, your, your question about the crowding. What Singapore recently did was they made it cheaper to travel before peak hours. Right. And so um, it moved to like 5% of the people really? to earlier. So it, it basically relieved the crowding by making it cheaper to go earlier. And people who were cost sensitive moved earlier and mm -hmm. then they moved many more people. I through. believe those, that, that was a discussion at the T. Um, I definitely heard of that um, being discussed and shared. There's always a trade-off with a complicating your fare schedule. You know, people like to know kind of what things are, and then, you know, trying lots of different things. Because if you try lots of different things, you'll get results. But people will be like, "Wait, how much was it to mm -hmm. travel? What did I pay? And you know, how much will it cost me to go here?" So, right, right. you want to keep it simple, but also solve some problems at the same time. Oh, absolutely. And when you talk about just even, um, again, I go back to the disabled and the elderly. I mean, right. We do have a lot of elderly community yes. that we have to be cognizant of, like the ride. You know, right. I mean, you know, and it is expensive to take the ride. How do we get the people that maybe need the ride for certain uh, parts of the ailment or times, and then they can go and flow back into the system and take right. the, uh, obviously, the MBTA. So that's obviously another big issue. It is. I have to say, I don't know much about the ride. Right, right. I, I feel it is. A, I know it is a very expensive service, um, but but the more people from the ride we can get onto the T, obviously mm -hmm. you will save a tremendous amount of money, which means making things accessible, mm -hmm. you know, as, as accessible as you can, so that 
you're not using the ride. And I, mm -hmm. I, I remember back in the day, um, Mass General Hospital Station was not accessible for yeah, the bridge going. Yeah, until oh, the, you were here then. I was here then. Yeah. <laughs> so, until you know the new station, that was not an accessible no, station. You're right. That's kind of crazy because Mass General, of course, is like a place where many disabled people are going to want to go. That oh, the could, little footbridge, and then the they wouldn't be able to use the red deteriorated line. Deteriorated steps going right. down. So they wouldn't be able to use the red line to get there. They yeah. would have to use the ride. So yeah. now with you know that connection, a lot of people would be able to. That's great. Access it. Well, we're ready to wrap up, but how long have you been teaching that course? It just sounds really, I've been really, teaching really it for eight years. Really? I've, I've been a transportation planner for 20 years, mm. and the last eight years teaching that course, mm -hmm. and it's really great to see the creativity that young people bring to mm -hmm. the problems that we face. So. And how many boards are you on? Couple? Oh, not too many, just <laughs> a few, really. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so. great. And you're doing a lot of work in the Somerville area? Um, I like to stay local with my volunteer efforts mm -hmm. because I kind of feel like that's where you see the most impact. And, you know, I would say if you care about things in your community, get active, you know, join, right, right. join your neighborhood group and uh, try and make your transportation system, your streets, your sidewalks, um, your walk to the subway. Make those small changes so that you right. can enjoy them every day. No, you're right. And again, quality of life and alternatives to a vehicle, uh -huh. I think, walking, cycling. Sure, yeah. Yeah, that's all great. Well, thanks so much. I mean, My pleasure. That, a half hour went quick. Okay. And uh, all right, thank you very much uh, for uh, watching our show today. I just want to thank our sponsors, uh, Skanska USA Building, uh, Cardman Square Development Corporation, HBI, Historical Boston Incorporated, uh, we really appreciate your sponsorship. And uh, please um, join us next month. I have uh, a number of um, guests on cue for the next couple of months from the city of Boston, from private organizations and uh, construction companies. So thank you very much.